All right, good morning, church. Let's go ahead and get started this morning. If you would take your hymn books, should have a hymn book beside you this morning, and we will turn to hymn number 14. And if you could stand together and we'll sing out our first hymn, hymn number 14, Be Thou Exalted. Be thou exalted. Forever and ever, God of eternity, the ancient of days, wondrous in majesty, so mighty in wisdom, perfect in holiness, and worthy of grace. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song, saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee, thine be the glory forever, amen. On a second, be thou exalted, O Son of the highest, gracious Redeemer. Savior and King, one with the Father, co-equal in glory, here at thy footstool our homage we bring. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels, be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. On the last verse, be thou exalted, O Spirit eternal. Dwell in our hearts. Keep us holy within. Feed us each day with thy heavenly Healer of wounded hearts, thy praises we sing. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Great singing. At this time, Pastor is going to come and open with prayer. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come and assemble together to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we pray that as we sing songs of praise, as we look to your word, as we fellowship one with another, we pray that you would be honored, that you would be glorified by all that's said and done. We pray, Lord, that you would minister in all of our hearts. You know the needs, Lord, for grace, for truth, for conviction, for encouragement. 
I pray, Lord, that you would be sufficient and meet our needs today. Lord, if there's anyone that's under the sound of the gospel today that's not saved, I pray the Holy Spirit would convict them and draw them to that place of repentance and faith in Christ. Lord, we just want your name to be exalted. As we just sung, Lord, we pray that you would be all over this meeting, that you would encourage our hearts, stir our hearts for truth, for righteousness. And we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll continue with our song of praise and turn to 198 and sing, How Wonderful Art Thou. At night beneath majestic skies And know behind them is a God all wise Who fixed all stars in its lonely place And wrapped them in a darkened robe of space Almighty oh, God, how wonderful art Thou before thee bow I fail to comprehend it all somehow Almighty God how wonderful art thou on the second I see the moon stars in distant space and think of how the God of matchless grace is coming in the clouds to claim his own such wonders that on earth cannot be known almighty god how wonderful art thou to love the world while hands before thee bow i fail to comprehend it all somehow Almighty God, how wonderful art thou. Last verse, I scan the heads with rapture in my soul, and wonder how the God who made the whole could ever fix his thoughts on such as I, and give his son upon the cross to die. Almighty God, how wonderful art thou to love the world while hands before thee bow. I fail to comprehend it all somehow. Almighty God, how wonderful art thou. All right. As people said, Amen. Amen. I thought we were going to go for that last part of that chorus there. I was waiting for that. Sorry. Amen. All right. Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for being with us for our service. Thank you for those joining us online on the live stream. And we are so excited for uh, what God's going to do in our midst for this service. Uh, just a couple of things to be praying for. Uh, please pray for our missions conference coming up November 1st through November 4th. That's Sunday through Wednesday, first Sunday through Wednesday in, in November. And uh, we're praying that God does a work in stirring us and encouraging us for the cause of missions and world evangelism. And I hope you plan to be there. Try to be at each meeting. I know the Lord is going to have a special message just for you. And uh, the preacher is Samuel Esquivel, and he's a great preacher, great man of God. And he's going to challenge us. And I know God is going to do something to challenge us, to convict us, but also to encourage us for what we can do to assist in getting the gospel out around the world. And so that's Sunday, all day, our normal schedule, and then Monday through Wednesday, each night at 7.30 p.m. And then we want to just give a special thanks for the young adults that were able to come yesterday. We had a great time of fellowship going to the Poconos, and thank you for those who prayed for us. We had a great little hike and visit at the waterfalls, and we had a great time of fellowship and praying we can do something like that again very soon. But that was a, a very special time yesterday. All right, that's all for our announcements this morning. We're going to turn things over to Brother Josh, and let's prepare ourselves for our scripture reading this morning. All right. 
just make an announcement for the teens real quick. Just keep in mind uh, that we also have our Sunday school uh, curriculum online, uh, as well as the adults and everyone else online at our YouTube page. Um, also, this Friday, we'll be having a Zoom call at 730. Um, just be looking out for that. If we could stand together, we'll do our scripture reading together. Scripture reading together, we'll turn to Psalm 104, and we'll finish up this psalm. In verse number 20, we'll start. Psalm 104, beginning with verse 20. Psalm 104, beginning with verse 20. The scripture reads, Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together, and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work, to his labor, until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great, wide sea, wherein are things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them they gather. Thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. Thou hidest thy face, and they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and are turned to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his work. He looketh upon the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. Amen. It's a tremendous truth in that psalm. What encouraging thought. The Lord's in control over all his creation. We rejoice in that this morning. Let's have our ushers come as we prepare for our offering this morning. We'll ask our men to come. And we just want to ask and remind ourselves the tithe belongs to the Lord. And let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to continue to be good givers. And of course, this time of year, uh, we're praying that God would help us in renewing and may perhaps increasing our faith, promise, missions, commitments to giving to missions. And we pray that God, every year we always pray that God allows us to do more for missions, that we can take on more missionaries. And that takes the faithful prayers and giving of God's people So let's pray that God enables us to that end. Let's pray for this offering this morning. Father, we're grateful for all of your blessings that you give to us. Lord, help us to just continue being good and wise, faithful stewards over what you've entrusted to us. Lord, we pray that as we have the privilege to worship you through our tithes, our offerings, through our giving, that you would bless each gift and each giver, that you would be honored and glorified through this, and help us as a church to be good stewards of these funds, to continue advancing the gospel Lord, as our missions conference is approaching quickly, we are reminded of the great need to get the Word of God out around the world. And Lord, we know it takes the faithful praying and giving of God's people. Would you continue leading us and directing us? Help us to be obedient to how you'll direct us in our giving towards that. And may you be pleased and glorified by this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
crowd pressed in to see this man who stood condemned to die. A man they once proclaimed as king, they now would crucify. They laid a cross upon his back and pushed him up the road. The path would lead to Calvary, he fell beneath the load. And as I watched I understood the burden that he bore was more than just a heavy tree the weight was so much more the weight of the cross was the weight of my sin not the weight of the tree that was carried by him, my guilt and his grace, Jesus bore in my place, on Calvary's road, neath the weight of the cross. His face was scarred, his body bruised, his head was crowned with thorns. The crowd now jeered and cursed his name, the object of their scorn. He never spoke a word to them, the silent Lamb of God. The man of sorrow bore the cross, he chose to carry on. But somehow in his eyes I saw a love beyond the pain, as if he knew his sacrifice and loss would be my gain. The weight of the cross was the weight of my sin. Not the weight of the tree that was carried by him, my guilt and his grace, Jesus bore in my place on Calvary's road, on Calvary's road. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that, brother. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew, chapter 19. And as you turn to Matthew, you can also, I encourage you to um, also keep your place in Romans, chapter 1. We'll look at both passages together as we start out. And this morning, we are continuing our topical series on what is truth. And this morning, I want us to dive into this topic, the truth about homosexuality. The truth about homosexuality. You know, on the surface, I think that as Christians, we have a clear-cut answer because the Bible gives us a very clear answer. But yet, there is a great need for us to be able to explain that to a culture that's becoming completely biblically illiterate. We have to be able to understand what we believe and why we believe it. That's my hope to stir us up for the truth this morning, because we have the truth. Do you believe that this morning? 
It's not because we are so great, because we have a great God who's given us his great word, and so we can live by the truth. And so let's dive into that this morning, and this topic is one that's front and center in American culture, and so we have to have an answer on this, and we want to make sure the Bible guides us and directs us. But we're going to start here in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. And this is Jesus here. It says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And of course, the context here is a question about divorce, but Jesus Christ goes all the way back to the beginning to highlight that there's a fundamental principle, a moral law that God has established that marriage is between one man and one woman. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and let's look at verse 24. Romans chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Let's stop here and let's pray, ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have your word. Your word is truth. Your word sets us free. Your word guides us and directs us on how to live life, to be blessed. And Lord, it's because you love us that you've given us your word and you've given us your will. We pray as Christians this morning, as we engage in this important topic, help us to know the truth. But Lord, may you by your spirit teach us and enable us to be able to express that truth and witness to a lost and dying world. We're just praying you would guide me, Lord, that you would fill me, enable me to preach your truth with clarity, with boldness, with wisdom. May you be honored and glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're diving into this topic. Again, I, I think that it's one that is front and center in American culture. It's one that is not going to go away anytime soon. And so we have to be able to give an answer. You know, the answer can't just be, well, you know, I'm uncomfortable with that. Or, you know, that's not the way I was raised. Or, you know, I don't partic that goes against my opinion, my, my taste. No, it's much, much more deeper than that. Because all those answers are just... So they're just subjective. They can change, right, depending on the person. But if we can say there's a timeless, unchangeable, moral law that guides us in every generation, every society, we can point to that and point others to that. Wouldn't that be far greater in how we explain our positions? And so we have to realize a couple of things. On this issue of gay marriage and homosexuality, we have to realize that we're in the middle of a sexual revolution, what I mean by that is very rapidly, very quickly, our culture is institutionalizing sin in the sense that what 
someone would say in the past was wrong or immoral now is defended as a constitutional right. And the question then becomes, how can you stand against that? How can we as Christians hold our biblical values and tell the truth when the world's going to call us prejudiced, bigots, and we're, we're going against the Constitution even, perhaps? And so we have to navigate these waters. we got to engage the culture. We're not going to retreat. That's what some Christians say. Just keep your mouth shut. Be silent. We're not going to retreat. No, how do we engage our culture applying our biblical values? I suppose it kind of starts with this question, does this really affect me? Yeah, I suppose it's the libertarian argument of, well, if two people way out in San Francisco get married, they love each other, that, why does that have to do with me? That doesn't bother me one bit. And that's the argument that some of the gay advocates will say. Why does it concern you Christians so much? Well, there's a couple of reasons we can say this. First of all, we as, a Christ, as Christians, we want to live in a moral society, and we realize when immorality is embraced, that's going to destroy the fabric of society. As a Christian, we understand that from the Bible. But then secondly, this argument presupposes a couple of things. You know, the idea that, well, they're just going to get married. It's not going to bother us. They're going to stay in their box. They haven't stayed in their box. The gay issue is they're militant advocates that this is not an issue of just accept us. Now it's we will punish you. This issue has very quickly become one that is permeating our, our public education system, where now there has to be a rainbow curriculum. Even kids as young as kindergarten have to be taught books where there's two mommies and two daddies, and it's okay. And now it's all over, our, it's all over Hollywood. You can't put on a movie or a TV show, even a quote-unquote clean Disney movie, without some protagonist advocating for this gay lifestyle. They're not staying in their box. But they say, Christians, you keep your views in the four walls of your church. That's not what the gospel tells me to do. That's not what Jesus tells me to do. They're not staying in their box, but Christians have been beat up and pushed back, and they think, well, we got to just keep silent. We don't want to offend anybody. And Christians are staying silent. No, this morning, I want to stir our hearts for truth. I'm not saying that we're going to go after people and be nasty at people, but we have to stand where God stands and be valiant for the truth. Because here's the thing, is, it, is the truth a blessing or is it a curse? Is it a blessing when we promote the biblical family? That's a wonderful blessing for society, so why shouldn't we bold, be bold and saying this is what's actually going to help people? One man and one woman for life. And so the church cannot duck this question. The church cannot avoid this question because it's one that's in our culture, it's not going away. And the other side to this is that there is an inevitable collision course between the LGBTQ agenda and religious liberty. There's this runaway train that they're going to impact, and it's going to come where they're going to say, hey, you're going against the Constitution. We've got to take away some of your protections, tax exemption status. We might take away this, take away that. People are already whispering about some of these things. So there's this collision course, and it was revealed back in the Colorado case of the Colorado Baker, and in the, went all the way to Supreme Court, and the issue was not that a gay couple wanted to buy a cake and they didn't want to sell them a cake. Of course, anyone can go into a store and buy anything. That's, that's right. Anyone can come to, into our church. If a gay person comes into our church, they should come and sit and listen to the preaching, praise the Lord, hear the gospel. But the issue there was they were requiring that Colorado Baker to, to create a unique cake for their wedding, and that baker was a Christian that went against his conscience. And in like manner, if a gay couple came and attended our service, that's great. But if they asked me to marry him, I would have to exercise my conscience and say, I can't do that. And so that's the issue here. These things are coming to play here. And so we have to, as Christians, identify what's happening and be able to give an answer. This sin is not a new sin. Homosexuality has been around forever. Because sin has been around forever, right? And so the issue here in America is that it's now been institutionalized, where now it's an identity. And so the question then, again, is how do you talk about a truth that is, some people feel is at the very core of who they are? Very difficult, but we still must do it. I believe in this issue there is a call to some type of action. I believe that it includes a lot of things. It may include political 
I think if you look at what's happening, uh, I, last week I preached on the abortion issue, on the cause for pro-life, and I believe there is a political party that will help that. But when, on the gay issue, I think it's a tragedy that there really isn't a political answer. No candidate is coming out against gay marriage anymore. I think that's terrible. That's sad. Now, I look at what's happening. I, th I see the far left really advancing the narrative, especially with transgenderism and all of that. But when's the last time you heard a politician say, I think this is wrong? I believe in the sanctity of marriage, one man, one woman. You go back just a few years ago, both sides were saying that. I mean, you can see speeches given by Democrat candidates, Republican candidates, they all were saying that, but then something dramatically changed. And so maybe there might be a move. Some are standing for what we talked about, religious liberty. Some are standing for that, and praise the Lord for that. That's noteworthy. But by and large, that's not going to be the solution. Some are pushing for social action. Well, I'm going to protect the education system and protect my children from what they're edu being educated by, or guard what they watch, guard the environment they're in. That's important. That's a good move. I think that's wise. But whatever action you take, you better make sure, as a Christian, there needs to be a spiritual action that's taken, too. Because this, this issue is a sin issue, so there must be a spiritual problem, a spiritual solution, I'm sorry. It's a spiritual problem, so there needs to be a spiritual solution. Psalm 119, verse 136, the Bible says, Rivers of water run down mine eyes, because they keep not thy law. As a Christian, we ought to weep. We ought to be grieved that this sin is all over our nation now and fully embraced. I think it ought to start there that we weep. We're grieved when sin and its destructive power is unleashed on our society because we know from the Bible the misery that sin will bring. We're grieved. We ought to pray that God will be merciful. God destroyed entire city and region for this sin, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what's God going to do with America? So we grieve, we pray and seek for God's mercy and then we realize that the Bible is not silent on this issue, and so neither should we. We will not be silent on this issue. By the way, it doesn't matter what religious pope or leader gets up and says, well, now maybe we'll change. Maybe now gay unions are okay. The pope said that recently. We don't go by what man says. We go by what the word of God says. That's where it always starts and ends for us as Christians. So the truth about homosexuality, let's answer a few key points here. First, number one, is there such a thing as free love? That's at the heart of this issue, free love. Why can't two people who love each other be together? Why can't two people who love each other be together? Aren't you Christians for family values? Why do you want to break up families? Why can't two people who love each other, they're not harming anyone, why can't they just be together? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we already live in a society that has moral laws protecting what love is. For example, we have laws against incest. So we already know two people who quote unquote love each other can't be together in that context. We have laws against pedophilia. We already know that if someone has that desire, we say that it's immoral to act on that desire. We have laws against bestiality. You can go down the, go down the, the line there. So to, we already say two people who love each other, quote, unquote, can't be together. There's a moral way to fulfill that, and there's an immoral way to fulfill that. Society already knows that. And then we have to ask this question, where do we get our morals from anyway? How do we know what's right and wrong? Is it through Twitter and social media, what's trending in Hollywood these days? No, we realize as Christians that we have moral laws that were given to us by a moral law giver. That God is the one that created love and human sexuality, and so he determines how that is to be expressed and experienced. And so morality is not something that we just kind of make up as we go. It's something that needs to be timeless and changeless for every generation. And here's the question I, I want us to ask uh, the unsaved crowd, the skeptic crowd, the gay crowd, that what is best for society? A set of morals that are always changing every 10 years or every 10 minutes, maybe? 
or morals that never change, that are timeless, that are a blessing throughout the ages. And as Christians, we have that in the Bible, in the Word of God, timeless principles that have never changed. So this idea of free love, it's really a false idea here. The idea that we're free to do whatever we want to do. No, you're not. You're not free to murder, kill, rape, steal. Freedom is the freedom to do what is right and what is moral. That's what freedom is. And so the Bible describes homosexuality as immoral behavior that goes against God's natural design and order. I want you to go with me to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus 18 and verse 22. We have to stand where God and the Bible stand. And the Bible says in Leviticus 18, 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. We saw in the New Testament, Jesus gave us the fundamental principle of what human love and sexuality is supposed to be like between one man and one woman in marriage. We saw Romans 1. Paul laid it out that this sin is vile affections against the natural order. And here, Leviticus, God calls it abomination. He detests this particular sin. He hates this sin. And so we cannot accept or approve what God himself says he hates and detests. And so here's the rub here. America did not create marriage. Man did not create marriage. God did. The issue here is that God makes the rules. We don't. And so we do things God's way. God has an original design for mankind. That's a blessing. He doesn't make these rules to hurt us. He makes these rules to help us, to be a blessing to us. Sadly, sinners have forsaken God's design, whether through heterosexual sins like fornication, adultery, or homosexual sin. And by the way, regarding transgenderism, which is a big part of this, both the Bible and science reject that idea that you can be more than one gender or gender fluidity or there's dozens of genders out there. Jesus said male and female. Genesis tells us male and female. That's it. And science tells us you either have XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes. You're either male or female. And by the way, you study it out. All of that is determined at the moment of conception. When the egg is fertilized, immediately it's XX or XY. God says male or female. So this idea of transgenderism is not only unbiblical, it's not even scientific or biological. It's a fairy tale is really what it is. And so we have to be able to have this understanding that there's right and there's wrong. And who makes the rules on what's right and wrong? What man has said is, well, we, we make the rules. But the problem with that is that Who's to say you're right? Who's to say you're wrong? Right? Anything can go. There's no reserves there. Anything goes. If you leave God out, there's no exception for what's right and what's wrong because it's all what we feel like. Right? A Muslim terrorist will tell you, I feel like it's right for me to blow myself up. So what's the standard for right and wrong? And as Christians, we understand the standard is God and his word. Timeless, unchangeable principles. And we have to consider that if God doesn't exist, then there's no basis for right and wrong. And isn't it interesting that a lot of the arguments for homosexuality are moral arguments? It's wrong to persecute and go after homosexuals. It's wrong to discriminate against homosexuals. And so they say, who are you to say that this homosexual lifestyle is wrong? And we can say, who are you to say that it is right? Right back at you. And the reality is we can say, I'm not saying it. God is. And I'm just trying to obey God. That's the issue here. We're standing not in our own ideas of morality, but what does God tell us is moral and immoral? Then there's a second point I want us to consider this morning. Are people born this way? Are people born this way? Another key part of this argument. You say, I'm born this way. You say, I have this inclination that I was born with. And how do we answer that as Christians? Well, first of all, the Bible is very forthright and clear that this behavior is a sin and goes against God's design. That means God never created man to fulfill this desire. 
God did not create, that was not his intention in creating male and female. So that's not a part of his design. So then why are people gay? Why, are pe why do people turn to homosexuality? Well, a couple of things. The gay community is split on this question. I hope you know that. Because the transgender people say it's not biology. It's what, you're, it's what you self-identify as. I could be a man today and tomorrow I feel like I'm a woman. That's okay. And then the born this way people say, no, it's what you're born with. It's how you're born. That's what determines. And so there's this fighting even between them. But here's the thing. As Christians, the Bible gives us a very easy answer. We're living in a fallen world. And ever since the fall of man, man has had sinful inclinations. Ever since the fall of man, men have had sinful desires to steal, to lie, to murder, to express sexuality in sinful terms. That's been the case ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the fall of man. So it ought not surprise us. Now, here's the thing. We are not meant to act on sinful desires. Just because you have a wicked desire doesn't mean you act on that sinful desire. That's the issue here. The good news is that Jesus Christ came to deliver us from our sinful desires. The gospel tells us that we're sinners in bondage to our sin, but Jesus came and died on the cross and was buried and rose again to free us from sin, to forgive us and pardon us and make us clean. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to enable us to triumph over sin so that when we get saved, we don't go right back to our sin. We're delivered from that sin. Amen? We're free from our sin. And so the excuse of, well, this is how I feel, how I'm born with, that's not a valid excuse. Again, we can go to certain places and pedophiles will tell you that's just an inclination, a desire I have. I can't help myself. So we got to set this standard here. Sinful desires do not e equal a human right. The gospel tells us that when we accept Christ, he forgives us and helps us to overcome and resist sin. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, folks, there's nothing new under the sun. This sin has always been around. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. And in this passage, the Apostle Paul is giving a list of sin that if man embraces and are unrepentant, that sin's going to lead him to hell. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. And such were... Some of you, Paul is saying, listen, you believers at Corinth, you used to partake in those sins. You very much were identified, characterized by those sins. Past tense, such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Praise the Lord. Paul is reminding us here that the gospel penetrates all sin. There's no sinner that's too far from God's grasp in salvation. There's no sin too vile that the gospel can't transform, forgive, and deliver someone from. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is proof of that. And by the way, you think of Corinth. The city of Corinth was a very, very wicked and moral city. A lot of sexual sins and prostitution and even in religion was intermixed in that city. And that's where a church was. Amen. And the gospel was reaching people there in that wicked city. Imagine that. And Paul said, such were some of you. So I don't care about an inclination or what you think you were born with. Or I'm talking about Jesus Christ can deliver you and save you if you'll trust him, if you'll let him. And that also means as a Christian, I don't write people off as Christians. As a Christian, I don't just completely avoid a whole segment of the, of the population and say they are unsavable, right? Because the gospel can save anyone. Take it from the Apostle Paul and his testimony here. I think it also means as Christians that we have to understand that our culture is deceived. 
that it's embracing lies, that men aren't men and women aren't women. And that means as families, we ought to teach and raise our children that there are distinctions between the genders. You parents, we parents, we have to fight against this culture. Hey, you boys, you're, you're, you're designed and created to grow up and to be men. And you young girls, you're designed and created to be women. And you're different, and that's a blessing. God made you to be different. The idea that we're made in the image of God, I believe our differences coming together in society reflect God's perfect design. And God wants us to complement one another. Society needs males and needs females that are masculine and feminine, respectively. And we're getting away from that, and that's why we're in the mess we're in. And so you have little Tommy. He grows up, and maybe he's a little boy, and he puts on mommy's shoes to try them out. And then 10 years later, he says, you know, I, I must be gay because I put on mommy's shoes 10 years ago. It's like, no, listen, you were just curious, and maybe mommy should have put dad's shoes on you instead, but that doesn't mean you're gay. And people are turning to just so much confusion today. And so we have to be able to give them the truth. That brings me to my third point here, that there there's a needs to be a gospel witness. There needs to be a gospel witness. We have to zero in on the sin issue at its core. That we're going after the sin of homosexuality. And I don't want to be graphic, but it is a behavior and an act. I know people are using it, this is my identity, this is my community, but first and foremost, it's a behavior and an act. And there is a great distinction between an orientation and the act, just like there could be a distinction between an inclination for someone to be proud or someone to tell a lie and actually act on that temptation. Do you follow me there? And so we have to zero in on the sin here. And here's what I want to just explain to you this morning. The statistics show that 3% of the population says that they're gay. They're part of the gay community. But only about 1% or so are actually, you could say, active or have a partner. And so I think that means that there's a lot of people who may identify as gay, but they're just confused. They're just broken. They're looking for something, and they think this is going to be an avenue to help them. And they don't even know maybe what they're turning to. You know, the other day we heard someone said an 8-year-old can, can be gay and transgendered. And what does an 8-year-old know about that stuff? What do children know about to make a decision like that? So I believe most of these folks, a large segment of them, are people who feel confused, rejected, unloved. And the devil comes along with a tool, hey, you can find that by being gay. Come out. And isn't that what happens in our society? You come out as gay. I mean, Hollywood celebrates you. A man becomes a woman. The president gives them a call and congratulates them. Can you imagine? A you know, Bruce Jenner becomes a woman. He's only a woman for six months. He wins woman of the year. You figure that one out. Some of you just got that one. <laughs> but here's my point here, that there's a confusion here. And so when we zero in on the sin issue, people are broken and confused. And we have to ask ourselves a question, does the gospel have an answer for people like this? Does the gospel have an answer for people that want love, that want acceptance, that want community? Absolutely the gospel does. When you come to Jesus Christ, you are accepted in the beloved, the Bible says. You don't have to work for God's acceptance. You have it because you're in Christ. Amen. When you come to Christ, you experience love, true, unprecedented love, unconditional love. Christ never says, I love you today, but I don't know about tomorrow. It's unconditional love when you accept Christ. We have community when we come to Christ. People are looking to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Well, the gospel gives us that we're a part of the church. We're a part of the body of Christ. We're connected to believers down through the ages and all around the world. Christ gives us all of that and more. And we have to be burdened and realize that Jesus Christ died for heterosexuals and homosexuals. And that the solution, the cure for homosexuality is not heterosexuality. It's Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. That's the answer. And so people are looking to belong to somewhere, belong to something. And we can belong to Christ. And so I think it means as Christians, we need to consider how can I be a witness? 
If the gospel really is powerful, can transform lives, how can I be a witness? It means a couple of things that as I go out and speak the truth, I'm going to encounter two types of people, really. I'm going to encounter people that are hurting, broken, and they're confused, and they're seeking the truth. And I can present them the truth. And then I can meet people that they have hard hearts. And they don't want to hear what I have to say. I mean, they don't care how nice you are, how friendly you are, how well-dressed you are. They completely reject the message, which means they completely reject Christ. And we have to realize we're not in the heart hearts business. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I pray for them. That's the Holy Spirit's job to change a hard heart. But for the ones that are open and seeking, and I believe there are many that are, we can speak the truth in love. I think we need to understand the opportunity to present Christ in the public square. Do it in a way to persuade people to come to Christ. Someone said when we talk about these issues, talk about them as if you have a relative right in the middle of it. And for many people, they do. And so how do we respond? Well, first, we got to explain to people that there is a God. There is a God who has expressed his will through the Word of God, through the Bible. And that means that we use apologetics. We defend. We give a reason of the hope that's within us, right? We explain to people the Bible is true. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The Bible tells us that God has a plan for us. And we explain to people God's design. And then I believe we can also tell people that there's another side. When you embrace sin, it's not all fun and games. We can explain that even if you leave the Bible aside, that the homosexuality behavior community is self-destructive. Self-destructive. I know Hollywood and gay pride and all the stuff happening puts a happy face on all of this, but there are some serious issues behind the LGBTQ community. In 2017, the CDC reported that where HIV status was known, 45% of gay men were HIV positive. That's terrible. Or almost half of that population is HIV positive. The studies show that they are far more promiscuous. And the number of gay men who experience lifelong monogamous fidelity is almost zero. You know what that means? They're looking for love and they're not even finding it. They have multiple partners throughout their lifetime, can never settle down. That's not a recipe for a family, for society, for a happy life. It's just not. But the world says, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? Again, going back to the health concerns, STDs are greatly increased among the homosexual population. Bacterial infections like gonorrhea, syphilis are rampant in this population. They're only about 2% of the population but yet this very small group accounts for more than 50% of cases of syphilis studies show. And so think about this, even from a medical perspective, we're, we're talking about the coronavirus and stopping the curve and all of that. And what about sexually transmitted disease and all? This is in our community. So is homosexuality a benefit to individuals and society at large, even from a medical perspective? And then there are tragic statistics about the psychological impact. The American Academy of Pediatrics revealed alarming levels of suicide among transgender youth. More than half of transgender male teens reported attempting suicide in their lifetime, teenagers. 30% of female teens have attempted suicide. Among non-binary youth, they don't know if they're male or female, they're on the spectrum, so, so to speak, 42% say they attempted suicide at some point in their lives. And the studies show that the gay population, there's 10 times the national average of attempted suicide. That's terrible. That's tragic. Again, that ought to make us weep that people are turning to this thing that's making them want to commit suicide, depressed, anxiety, unhappy, full of disease. That's not a recipe for a good society. That's not a recipe for a blessed life or a happy life. And so again, these are hurting broken people that need healing, that need community, that need love. 
And Jesus Christ provides all of the above. If people repent and turn to Christ, he gives you all of that and more. And so we can present Christ in such a way that we say, listen, this is what would be a blessing in your life if you just trust in Christ. Now, some people write off those studies and they say, well, it's because of you Christians and you guys are bigots and you hate us and so you make us miserable. But think about what's been happening in the last 20 years. Have Christians been winning this argument or has the culture been more accepting? So as the culture is more accepting, the, 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 the trends are still going up with suicide, depression, all of that, disease. So what's happening here? Well, a lot we can say, but I want to leave you with a couple of things. There's good news. The gospel is good news. That Jesus Christ can and is saving people out of this lifestyle. You know, I read some incredible testimonies of people that were delivered from this lifestyle. And still, God's still working on this. I read of a, a, a man that he grew up in a home where his parents were divorced, and each parent became gay. Father became gay. Mom became lesbian. And that caused him to go on a journey to see Christ. And he got saved, and now he's a pastor today. I read of a lesbian woman who was a professor at a prominent university in upstate New York, fully entrenched in the lesbian lifestyle, and again, that seeking, that curiosity for the truth, and God led her on a journey, and she was completely delivered from that and saved. So I tell you that to encourage you, that there's good news. God is working, because the gospel always works. And so I encourage us as Christians that as we explain what we believe, we can do it in a way we explain why we believe it. Speak the truth in love and compassion. We explain that we have an all-wise God who loves us and wants what's best for us. And so what I often say is that I'm not just anti-gay, I'm pro-family by God's design. God knows what the family needs to be, and that's what's best for society. And I want to follow God's plan. But then there is bad news, that you can be as nice and friendly as you want to be, but at some point the truth is going to offend somebody. At some point your Christian worldview is going to offend people. It's going to offend the culture. The truth always does. And the temptation for Christians is, well, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to rock the boat. And so I'll just keep silent. You know, Jesus gave a word to his disciples and I believe he gives the same word to us. He said in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. But be, they, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You see, he's saying you've got to learn how to navigate your culture. Understand you're going out in the midst of wolves who are going to despise you and hate your message. You can be harmless as a dove, but may you also be wise as a serpent too. And so as a Christian, we've got to realize this issue is very important, and we can't stay in our box and stay silent. It's all over the culture. And so what's the answer? It's the gospel. We have to get right to the gospel and show people that Jesus Christ is the answer to meet all of our broken needs and desires. So as Christians, may we be stirred for the truth and not remain silent. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you give us your word, you express your will to us. Lord, we're thankful that you, in your perfect design, established the family. And Lord, I believe there's an attack on our families today. So we pray a special prayer that you would protect our families. Guard us against these various tools of the enemy to take away from the Christian home through homosexuality, fornication, adultery, divorce, all types of wicked sins in our culture today. Lord, I pray that you would preserve mor morality, righteousness. And Lord, that means we have to take a stand for the truth. So we pray today for boldness. Lord, help us wherever you plant us to speak the truth in love and stand where you stand. Lord, I pray that we would embrace the gospel and embrace the effect that it can have on sinners, and we would be bold in sharing the gospel, even with people with whom we disagree. Lord, give us the compassion that we need and the boldness that we need. 
Lord, we also pray that you be merciful to our nation. Lord, we're grieved today that this sin is rampant all over our nation. And we think of where things are headed in the future generations. Lord, we grieve over that. And how much are you grieved? But we pray you would be merciful. We pray you'd send revival, Lord. Though we don't deserve it, Lord, send revival and turn the tide. We pray that we would see truth and righteousness exalted in our land. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, maybe you're here this morning and you, under, you need to understand the power of the gospel in your life. Whatever sin issue you may have, the gospel can deliver you. Jesus will save you, forgive you, and cleanse you. You can have eternal life. The gospel is clear. Jesus Christ died on the cross. We're sinners. He's the Savior who took our place. And if you trust in him, he'll forgive you and save you. I wonder if there's anyone here that would say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need salvation. I need to trust Christ today. That's my need. Would you slip your hand up? I'll pray for you. Say, I need to be saved. Oh, can we pray for our nation and pray that God would give us opportunities to stand for truth and righteousness. Pray that God would enable us to continue being a witness, to not be silent, but to speak the truth in love. Father, we pray that you would continue to encourage us and challenge us with these thoughts. Build us up in our faith. Stir us up, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to close by singing a hymn together today. Let's sing number 301, number 301, only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now, number 301. There's mercy with the Lord, and he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you. He will save you now, for Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. I encourage you to come back tonight at 6.30 p.m. for our evening service. We'll be preaching from Nehemiah chapter 2. But let's dismiss with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to meet together. Thank you for the fellowship, the spirit, the presence of your, uh, your, your spirit amongst us. We pray that you would just continue to encourage us with these truths that we studied as we depart. And I pray that we can apply them to our lives. Help us as we depart. Bring us back safely for our meeting tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.